If you will, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of Jonah. It's a small book tucked way back in the, the latter part of the Old Testament. It may take you a while to find it, and we're going to park it there a little bit this morning. So I'm going to give you a head start to go ahead and find that four-chapter book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Hard to believe that this morning is actually the final message in this six-part series called Into the Fields, and this message series, really, I hadn't planned to, when I first started the interim process here, I hadn't planned on preaching this series, but kind of getting a, a feel for the West Conroe context and culture, really thought, uh, after getting some feedback from the staff, that this was the direction to which we ought to go. And so for the last six weeks, we've been working through this series called Into the Fields, and the title is based on a couple of passages of Scripture, one in John 4, another one in Matthew 9, where Jesus is telling those around him, specifically his disciples, look at the fields. He's talking about the people fields, that they're white unto harvest. The harvest is abundant, which means there are people out there in Conroe, Texas, and Montgomery County who are starving to hear the gospel, the good news, that they can be reconciled to a holy God and that their, their life has meaning and purpose. And so I hope you believe that the harvest is abundant, but Jesus said the workers are few. And so to pray to the Lord of the harvest for more workers in the harvest. And so that's for what we've been working. That's the direction toward which we've been heading. And in this series, we've not only been reminding ourselves of the mission statement of West Conroe, which is a takeoff on the Great Commission, but we're also implementing it through this series. Hopefully we're implementing it that you are now seeing people through different eyes. Maybe you have seen them more as a nuisance than those in need, that you have been intolerant of those instead of showing compassion, being physiologically affected by their eternal plight. And so that's what we've been doing, reminding ourselves of the mission and implementing it, all and asking you to pray for and invest in at least one person that you know needs to know the Lord, or maybe they don't even have a church home, and God is using your relationship with them uh, to have some spiritual conversations, to hopefully share with them the gospel, uh, that they can come to know Christ. I don't think there's any greater joy in this life than having led someone to life in Christ. I've had that privilege to do that. I don't think there's any greater joy on the planet. And this series is, has been pointing to next Sunday, which we're calling Harvest Sunday. Why Harvest Sunday? Because we'd love to see God really reap a wonderful harvest of souls. Those friends of yours, family members of yours, co-workers of yours, neighbors of yours, in whom you've been investing, for whom you're praying, and you're inviting them to next Sunday, where I'm going to be sharing a gospel message and sharing them, hey, this is what the gospel offers to you. This is why your friends and family, neighbors and co-workers invited you to be a part of this. So please, please continue to invest and pray. And this six-week series should not be lost on this six weeks. This should be the ongoing implementation of the Great Commission and the mission of West Conroe Baptist Church. So we're long to see next week uh, people to hear the gospel, to see you and act, the West Conroe family in action. Again, the staff is rolling out the red carpet. It's going to be a great day. And again, to see the harvest of souls as people confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. We live in an age and a culture to where many people don't even know who Jesus is. You agree with that? It doesn't matter if you agree with it. It's true. Okay? So... An old nun was living in a convent near next to a construction site, and she noticed the coarse language of the workers and decided to spend some time with them and correct their ways. She decided she would take her lunch, sit with the workers, and talk with them. So she put her sandwich in a brown bag and walked over to the spot where the men were eating lunch. Sporting a big smile, she walked up to the group and asked, and do you men know Jesus Christ? They shook their heads and looked at each other, very confused, and one of the workers looked up into the scaffolding and yelled out, anybody up there know Jesus Christ? One of the steel workers yelled down, why? The other worker yelled back, because his wife's here with his lunch. <clears throat> I thought they laughed a little more in the 8 o'clock service, but anyway. 
So let's once again revisit the mission statement of West Conroe. Here it is on the screen. You ought to know it by heart, right? You are connecting all generations to God's greater journey, all generations doing whatever it takes to reach another generation as well and to connect them to God's greater journey. Hope, hopefully you're living that journey that you would wish your life in Christ on anybody else that you are experiencing the Christ life to the fullest. And here's an extrapolation of that mission statement. Look at this on the screen. This is on your website. We believe that God has placed the church body of West Conroe Baptist Church in this location in order to connect all generations through, number one, worshiping together in word and praise, growing in your relationship with Christ and being the hands and feet of Christ while serving the community and the world. So worshiping together through word and praise, that's a part of God's greater journey. That's what this is all about, you growing in Christ. It's also through, worship, or through, uh, through growing in your relationship with Christ. There are multiple opportunities for you, not only to grow individually, but together as a church family, to, to, to live in community, to, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. That's why we have life groups, so that you can not only study the word, but be in fellowship and community with one another. That's why we have all these other studies for children and a, and a student ministry and kingdom men or kingdom man and a women's Bible studies, on and on and on, so that you can grow in your relationship with Christ and experience God's greater journey. And then thirdly, serving the community and the world, being the hands and feet of Jesus to our community and to the world, which is where we're going to focus this morning. And hopefully, I know some of you out here in the lobby, the foyer, whatever you call it, it are some exhibits of some of the ministries in which West Conroe is involved, not only low locally, but internationally. And I would hope that after our time together, as God stirs you, hopefully as the Holy Spirit stirs you, that you will go out there and see how you can be a part of that third part of experiencing God's greater journey, which is what's serving, which is what you were created to do. And so what I'd like, and I hadn't planned on preaching this message. Kay and I were talking in staff meeting, and she said something about uh, to, 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 how are you going to challenge our people to get uh, into what field are, would you challenge them to enter? And this message instantaneously came to my mind. And so we're looking at just a few verses in Jonah, and we're asking the question, I'm going to ask the question, where is Tarshish for you? That's hard to say, Tarshish, but uh, where is Tarshish for you? And I'll explain a little later. So Jonah, chapter one, by way of introduction, we're going to read the first three verses and we're not going to, this is a short book, four short chapters. We don't have time to take a deep dive into all of this. We'll kind of touch the highlights, but uh, turn your attention to your Bible, to your device, to the screen. I know you've been standing a lot, but guess what? Let's stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Verse 1, chapter 1, Jonah, the Word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down it, into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Let's pray. God, I pray that today, again, you might stir our hearts and minds to the calling to which you have specifically called each of us. And I pray you would use the few verses in this book, even the entire book, Lord, to show us where it is that you want us to go, what you want us to be, how you want us to serve. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Take your outline or your Bible. You can jot down some notes as we move through this. But we don't have a whole lot of history about the man Jonah. Some have dismissed this whole book, these four chapters, as a fairy tale or a, a, a parable. But Jonah was actually a, a real person. We know that because in 2 Kings 14.25, we read that Jonah was a prophet in Israel around the years 786 to 746 B.C. Even Jesus referred to Jonah as a real person. Look at this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. For as Jonah was in the belly 
of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's preaching. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. So if Jesus believed that the story of Jonah was real, then I believe it as well. Some believe that there's no way for someone to stay alive in a big fish for three days and three nights. Even though we're now, do you remember a year ago when the gentleman up in Cape Cod was swallowed by a whale and lived to tell about it? He was in there for a time, but he lived to tell about it, so it is possible. And if God can raise someone from the dead after having spent three days and three nights in a tomb, then certainly he can keep a man alive in the belly of a fish. And everybody agreed and said... So I believe this is a real story about a real man and a real place. But let's get to the history of Nineveh, where Jonah was told to go. Nineveh was a city in Assyria, located about 500 miles north and east of Galilee. So if you know anything about Israel, you've got the Mediterranean Sea over here, you've got Jordan to the right, you've got Lebanon and Syria, and then to the north is, is the, uh, of Israel is the, is the area of Galilee. And so Nineveh was about 500 miles north and east in the in area of what we know as Iraq today. So in the middle part, uh, now by the, by, by, uh, near the end of Jonah's life, Assyria was coming to her peak as a superpower and known for its terror and power. And in the middle part of the 8th century BC, about the time that this story took place, Assyria had a hundred year old reputation in the Middle East of being a cruel enemy. There are countless records of the escapades and tortures that Assyrians would inflict upon their enemies and captives. One has written this, it is as gory and blood curdling a history as we know. They were cruel. So the Assyrians were feared and hated by all the people in the ancient Middle East. So think right now Hamas. That is what Nineveh, the Ninevites were, the Assyrians were in that day, a feared and cruel people. These are the same Assyrians who were a threat to Israel, who eventually conquered Israel. If you know anything about the history of the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, in 722 BC, 722 BC, the Assyrians captured Israel and took 30,000 Israelites into captivity, or uh, uh, Hebrews into captivity. And the, uh, the Assyrians were the first to ever practice this idea of exiling those people that they conquered. So we have a, it is in that context that we have the calling, this, uh, this, uh, the word of the Lord coming to Jonah to go to this evil empire and to preach against it is what God said. So as we walk through this, just a portion of the book, specifically these three verses, I want to look at two things. Number one, we're going to look at the call of Jonah. All right, there was the call of Jonah. Look at Again, chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord, the call from the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now, why would the word of the Lord come to Jonah? Because we saw earlier in second Kings, or I mentioned in, uh, that earlier, that he was a prophet. And what were prophets? They were spokespersons for God. A priest was a mediator or someone who, who was a, a spokesperson for mediated between man to God, and a prophet was one who mediated between God and man, spoke on behalf of God. So God would raise up these prophets uh, throughout the history of his people to speak to his people, by and large, not to predict future events, even though that was a part of prophecy, but to proclaim a message, repent. That was the common denominator message of a prophet, repent repent. And so God raised up, again, these prophets all through history. So Jonah was God's spokesperson. But it's interesting in these four chapters um, that the, the, the story is more about Jonah than it is about his message, more about the messenger than it was his message. And Jonah was not told to go preach or to prophesy against God's people, but against these foreigners, these enemies of God's people who would ultimately conquer them and lead many of them into exile. And if you read, and the call was to what? Preach against it. And we find out later in the, the book that the message was that God was going to destroy Nineveh, this wicked city, in 40 days if they didn't repent. So that was the call of 
Jonah from God to go preach against this evil city, to preach God's judgment on this wicked city. It would be like someone today going to Pyongyang uh, in, in the North Korea or Tehran in A- A- Iran or Gaza City even today to preach a message like this. Unless you repent, <laughs> God's gonna bring judgment. Again, this has more to do, this whole book has more to do with, with Jonah than it does the prophecy. And so these, these four small chapters about Jonah and what God wants to show him. So how does this apply to you? You may be thinking, well, I've never been called by God to go to Iran or North Korea or to Gaza or uh, anywhere else. Probably not, but the word of the Lord has come to you in some way, has it not? You may say, well, I, I, I don't think the word of the Lord has ever come to me. I, I don't ever uh, remember being called by God. Well, if you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, guess what? You have been called by God. That's what the Bible says. So that's, that's the first call. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time in each of these subpoints, but first of all, God, God calls you to salvation. The Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless he draws him. That means calls or leads him. So you just didn't wake up one day and think, ah, I think I'll become a Christian. No, it's because the, 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 the Lord opened your eyes and called you to salvation. So there are some scripture passages there to, to um to, to show you the, the calling. Secondly, God calls us to sanctification. What is sanctification? It's a process of becoming more like Christ. We are to be sanctified. This is God's calling on your life. Again, there are, there are verses there that substantiate and show you that. Thirdly, God calls us to service. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that every Christ follower has been given a manifestation of the Spirit. And a manifestation of the Holy Spirit means you have this spiritual gift. Look at this definition of this on the screen, a spiritual gift. It's any talent or ability which is empowered by the Holy Spirit and able to be used in the ministry of the church. And so the question is, are you exercising your spiritual gift? Hopefully you know what your spiritual gift is. I think every Christian ought to know their spiritual gift as much as they do their their phone number. This is my my one or two or three spiritual gifts that God has entrusted to me. And are you exercising that within this body? Just think if everybody was exercising their spiritual gift to the extent that you are, how healthy would West Conroe be? So God has called you to exercise your spiritual gift. Again, I'm skipping all of these passages that that, um, substantiate this, but let's go on to the next call of God, which is what? It's to suffer. (laughs) That's right. God calls us to suffer. Right there in 1 Peter 2, it says, this is to what God has called us. This is not much what we want to advertise to people to whom we're sharing the gospel, but but, but, uh, Paul said, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. As we sang a little bit ago, when we're going through a time of suffering, we're going to raise a hallelujah, right? But we are called to suffer for the cause of Christ. It's not that you go looking for it, but it's a part of it. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials and tribulations. So God has called us to suffer. Next, God has called us to share. To share what? The gospel. That's right. The mandate, the responsibility, the joy of every Christ follower, as I said a few minutes ago, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I don't know how. No, it's not that you don't know how. Maybe that you, maybe that you lack the courage. Because if you know how you came to Christ, then certainly you can tell somebody else how they can come to Christ. It's really simple, right? That you were born into sin, you you deserve to pay for your sin, but God sent a Savior who was sinless, who satisfied the wrath of God and the law of God. And if you confess Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you can be born again. You can have eternal life and abundant life. Now, there's obviously a little more to it, but that in essence is what the gospel is. That sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God through what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, and that is the only way to eternal life. That is the only way to be fulfilled in this life. So God calls us to share. But here's what, on what I want to focus in the next couple of hours, okay? So um, here it is. God calls us to something specific. 
I believe this. I believe God calls every Christ follower to something specific, above and beyond perhaps all the things at which we looked earlier. I believe God calls us to all of those, but God is calling every one of you to something specific. So to what did God call Jonah? Well, let's look at verse two. Here it is. Get up, (laughs) go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. This is that specific thing to which God called Jonah. Again, you may be asking what this has to do with you and about you getting into the fields. Again, I believe God has called you to some field, maybe other than some of the things to which we've referred earlier that God has called you to share. What, What does that mean? So most of you know by now that through the 25 years of me being a a pastor, my passion, I think the, the platform that God has given me as a pastor for 25 years is to invest in men, to call them out, to raise them up, to take their rightful place as the spiritual leader of their home, spiritual leaders in their church. And so I have the opportunity to speak to groups about how do you reach, raise, and release men. And I have three points. Number one is to create a culture, create a culture that says, hey, we're here to reach men unapologetically. We're, we're, not, we're not diminishing women's ministry, student and children ministry, but we know the statistics, as I've shared with you before, the role, the influence of a man. So create a culture that says we're going to reach men. Secondly, you cast a challenge. You tell men, hey, you can do it. Men, you're, the, you're to be the spiritual leader of your home. And then in that challenge, you provide a resource whereby they can become the spiritual leader in their home. That's why kingdom men came about, kingdom man came about, because we didn't want men to go, hey, I don't know how to do this. Well, here you go. Here's a good six-week start for you to learn how to become the spiritual leader in your home and to become a kingdom, kingdom man. So you, you create a culture that says we're gonna reach men. We, we, we cast a challenge to, to raise the bar for men. And thirdly, I tell them, cultivate their calling. Because I believe every man, every student, every woman has a calling of God on their life to do something specifically for the kingdom of heaven. So take, for example, Nehemiah. Now everybody, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to a king, a Persian king, a pagan king, and you know the walls of Jerusalem were in disarray. And so word got back to Nehemiah, hey, the walls of Jerusalem are in disarray. Now, probably every Jew was discouraged or disturbed by the fact that back home, the walls were in disarray. But it, it, it affected Nehemiah differently to where the Bible says that uh, it says that he went, he sat down and wept. It says that he mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So he was disturbed enough that God raised him up to do something about it. It's what one pastor said, and now what one author has written a book called A Holy Discontent, that you are discontent with something going on in the world or in the church, that you're going to do something about it. My discontent was not seeing men take their rightful place, and so I did something about that as a pastor. That, that, that's to what something specific that God had called me to do, again, above and beyond being a pastor. So Nehemiah was raised up to something specific. Let, let's fast forward to the New Testament. Acts chapter 13, verse 2, talks about the early church. Look at this. As they, the church, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... <laughs> wonder what that was like. The Holy Spirit said to them as they were worshiping and fasting, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have what? Called them. This is not something for which Barnabas and Saul volunteered. It's not something that the church elders got together and said, hey, what? you know what? You got, you, you got some skills here. We're going to send you out. No, this is what the Holy Spirit said to the church. Hey, set apart for me these two men to the service to which I have called them. And we know that what that service was what? To go share the gospel in those parts of the world and to plant churches. I, I could show you example after example of how God called people to something specific. And I believe God still does this. The same Holy Spirit that called him out, I, I believe still through his word, through circumstances, still speaks to us. And you know that to be true. 
The Bible says, even when it comes to salvation today, if you hear his voice, do not reject him. So I believe the same Holy Spirit that called out, raised up Nehemiah and uh, Saul and Barnabas is the same Holy Spirit that speaks to you and me today. And perhaps the word, the word of the Lord has come to you to do something specifically when it comes to your vocation or your occupation or your job. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, the word vocation, by the way, comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call, right? So I believe every, it should be that every vocation of a Christ follower is something to which you know God has called you and equipped you. I felt called, I, I was called to be a preacher, I was called two and a half, almost three years ago to a different role within the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. There, is this, there are people who are called to be nurses, called to be teachers, called to be lawyers. Can you believe God would call somebody to be a lawyer? But anyway, to, to, be, law, to be engineers, to doctors, they just say, this is to what God has called me to do. And they, they utilize that calling to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the fields to share the gospel. For instance, my dad, a godly man, uh, he, was, um, he wanted to be a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. He wanted to be a preacher, but he told me that God called him to be a mechanic. Amazing, isn't that? God, God called him to be a mechanic, and he said he was going to be the best mechanic to the glory of God and use that as a platform to share the gospel. My dad at one time was chairman of the deacons. My dad at one time was the associational royal ambassador director. My dad was involved in kingdom life as a mechanic. And I got to work with him all those years. He owned Angelo Brake Company for years. And so I grew up doing brake jobs and turning rotors and drums. And my dad used Angelo Brake Company as a platform, as a field with which and from which to share the gospel. So do you see your vocation as that, a calling from God, whether the classroom, a operating room, it, we could go down the line, could we not? That God is using your calling, uh, uh, something specific by which to share the gospel. There was a gentleman in our church in San Angelo, he spent 20 years in the Air Force, ret from Southern California, retired in, in, from the Air Force, his last stint was in, there in San Angelo, and so he, uh, he just had a passion, a holy discontent when it came to inmates down at the Tom Green County Jail. And so Dennis, on his spare time, would go down and just spend time with these inmates, get to know their story and share the gospel. And so he retired from the Air Force. Now he works at Goodfellow Air Force Base as a civilian, and he is the full-time chaplain for the Tom Green County Jail. So in his real job, he works from 6 o'clock in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, and then from 3 in the afternoon to 6 in the evening down at the Tom Green County Jail. That's his calling. That is something specific, and you couldn't talk him out of it. I mean, he loves it. Now, I've been down to the Tom Green County Jail, but that's not my holy discontent. That is his holy discontent. You see where I'm going with this? But there always seems to be, when God calls you out, and I don't know what, and I've talked to a couple of you guys in conversations over on the hill as we've met with Kingdom Man even here in the lobby, that, 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 that God is doing a stirring in your spirit, to step into something deeper and more and, and fuller. And you don't know what that is, but you know God is doing a stirring. And that's what happens is that there, there seems to be when God is stirring and calling you to step into something, there's this reluctance or fear on the part of those who hear it due to the difficulty or the danger of it or that it wasn't in your plans. You say, well, I, I, you know, God, that, this can't be your calling on my life. This is not for what I, you know, I planned, as I talked about last week. I mean, three years ago, I had planned to stay at Corpus Christi for another 12 years. And then God just changed everything up. So there's this reluctance on people not to follow the call. And then secondly, not only do we see the call of Jonah, let's look at the response of Jonah. <laughs> Look at what, verse three, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, the juxtaposition of these two phrases in Hebrew is quite comical. God said to rise and go, so Jonah rose and fled. That's exactly what he did. Interesting, Tarshish, Tarshish is mentioned three times in that one verse. 
And we find out later, by the way, why Jonah fled. He didn't flee to go to Tarshish because he was scared of the Ninevites. He knew that God was going to save them, that God was going to have compassion. And God and Jonah have this conversation. Jonah's disturbed about this shade tree. And God said, you mean to tell me you're more compassionate and worried about a tree than you are a pagan people that I would extend compassion? Because Jonah said, I knew that's what you would do, God. And I just wonder, by the way, this is a parenthetical idea in this greater message, but uh, do you, do, to think about those in Gaza, Hamas. Do you think they're worthy? I mean, do you think they deserve the grace of God? Do we think God's compassion is limited to just the people that we like? When Jesus said to, to, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So this was that dilemma going on with Jonah. God, I don't want to go there because I know you're going to extend compassion to our enemies that ultimately in 722 overthrew them. So instead of going to Nineveh, which we heard, saw a little bit ago was in Iraq, he, went to, he caught a, sh a ship at Joppa, which is now Tel Aviv, current day Tel Aviv, and started heading to Tarshish, which is current day Spain. 2,500 miles between Nineveh and Tarshish. And that's where Jonah was going because it said he was going to get away from the presence of the Lord. Now, come on, Jonah was a prophet. He knew that he couldn't escape the presence of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord came to him. But he wanted to get away from everything that reminded him about the call of God on his life to go to Nineveh. So he just took, he tried to hop on a boat and take off and to get as far away from that as he could. Just think, no one knew about Jonah's call other than Jonah. Who would he, who's he gonna tell? Well, God's called me to go to Nineveh. I'm gonna take a cruise, you know, to, to Spain. What does that mean? Some of you this morning, again, based on my experience as a pastor, it could be that you know God is calling you to something specific, a calling. You have this holy discontent that you've been disturbed about for some time, and you know God is calling you out to do something about it, but you're scared. It may be dangerous. It may be difficult. It may not fit into your plans, right? But when you confess Jesus is Lord, you said, now God, you're calling the shots. And some people have said, you know, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. That is not true. Sometimes the most dangerous place you can be is in the center of God's will, but it is the most full life you will live in the center of God's will. So it could be that you haven't told anybody about God's call in your life, but you're trying to get away from the, quote, presence of the Lord, so that's why you don't have a consistent study of God's word, because you know when you open it, the Holy Spirit reminds you, hey, by the way, I've called you to go to Nineveh, or I've called you to serve in this capacity or that capacity. So you don't really engage in worship because you think if I really surrender and acknowledge the value of God, then I've got to come to grips with what God is calling me to do. And I don't want to do it. And I've seen guys do this their entire lives in my ministry. They, they, get, they get fired up. They want to pursue God. And then God calls them to this specific calling. And they go, oh, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't want this. So they're running along in their Christian life. They come to this wall. You know what hitting the wall is for long distance runners? It means that they've hit this proverbial wall, uh, the figurative wall to where every, all their energy is depleted. And they don't think they can take another step. And so they, just by willpower, they run through the wall, keep going, and then finally, ultimately, see the victory or to get to, to cross the finish line. But I've seen guys my entire life get fired up. They hit that wall when God is calling them to go to something, and they give up. So they go back to start. And then they get preached to for another two years, and they start gearing up again, and all of a sudden, they hit this wall because they know God is calling them to something on the other side of that, but they're scared to death. And they live with regret their entire life. I have pastored guys in, uh, in my office who have wept because as an 18-year-old or as a 23-year-old, they hit that wall, they denied, they rejected God's calling in their life, and so they live this life with regret. You don't want to be that person. So it could be that God is calling you out to something. So the question is, where is Tarshish for you? Where do you go away from the, quote, presence of the Lord to try to forget everything that God is stirring up in you? 
Is it sports? Is it a hobby? Is it work? Is it a bottle? Is it a prescription? Is it TV? Is it just being busy? Because if you stay busy, you, you can't get quiet. Is it here? Do you come here on Sunday morning and kind of check this off your religious checklist because you feel better about having denied what God, to what God is calling you? And so, and why are you running? I mean, what, what, don't you think that the God who created you and saved you and is calling you out is going to provide and equip you? I mean, when we were in Corpus Christi back in August of 2020 and I get a call from the SBTC and they said, hey, this is what we can pay you. It was a substantial financial or, or a, a, a cut in income, but we knew God was provide, God had called us to this and we've seen God provide. So where is Tarshish for you? Why? To where are you running and why? But to live in the center of God's will is exhilarating and fulfilling. And you're going to give an account, by the way. Remember the first message I preached back in March in view of a call that you're going to stand before God and give an account of the life that he's entrusted to you because it's not your life for you to spend however you want to. It's God's life that he's entrusted to you. So look at what happened. Most of you know the story, but look in verse four very quickly. <laughs> so Jonah gets on this boat. The Bible uses the verbiage. He may have even bought the boat. Nobody knew again that God had called him to do this, but the Lord did. And in verse four, the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart to the point that everybody on the boat, remember this, they thought they were gonna die. They started jettisoning cargo. They started asking Jonah, hey, what's, what's going on? He said, well, here's the deal. If you just throw me overboard, then I think this storm will stop. They go, nope, that's not a good idea. So they can't do it. Some other things. But see, God was gracious to Jonah, chasing him down. Aren't you grateful that God's loving kindness chases after you? follows after you. That's what it means in Psalm 23. So I just wonder, you know, these sailors on this boat were being affected, thought they were going to lose their lives because of one man's disobedience. You know why? Because you don't sail alone. You think, well, I'm going to keep close to the chest what God has called me to do. And you don't think God is stirring up some circumstances in your life to get your attention. And it could be that your family is being affected by your rebellion and your disobedience. And God is saying, hey, wake up. This is to what I've called you. Remember Achan? In the Old Testament book of Joshua, he stole some of the treasure nobody knew but God knew, and his whole family suffered the consequence. 36 men lost their lives. The whole group of Israel lost that second battle because of one man's disobedience. So you don't sail alone. And after Jonah was tossed overboard by the sailors, you would think that's the end of the story. God said, okay, good. I've handled Jonah. He ran from me when I called him to go do something. I have had these sailors throw him overboard, and that's the end of that. We'll look at verse 17, chapter one. The Lord appointed a great fish. Don't you like that? Lord said, okay, you, I want you to go swallow Jonah. All right, go swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Again, you may be here this morning, God is stirring, calling you to something specific. And you've been running and reluctant to do what he's called you to do. But God loves you and is going to continue to pursue you. And God may bring some type of potential tragedy to get your attention. It could be that you've been thrown overboard. That's where you are right now in this calling, in this journey, the saga of God and you. And you're in distress and you thought you were going to die because that's what you deserved. And in your distress, what do you do? You call out in desperation, okay, God, I'm yours. I don't know why it took so long, so hard to do this. And God brings you up out of the pit, out of the sand into which you were sinking and the water in which you were drowning, and he delivers you. But it wasn't in the way that you quite expected. He brings a fish, not a Mediterranean cruise, not Navy SEAL Team 6. He brings a fish to you. And you still have the residue of your distress on your clothes, right? You may still have seaweed that you're picking out of your hair and out of your mouth. Your eyes still may be stinging from the salt water. 
You may be trying to get the taste of salt water out of your mouth. You got sand between your teeth. You have the scent of rotten fish and the odor of stomach acid. You're in the dark most of the time and you can hardly breathe because of the limited air supply at times. And he keeps you there for three days and three nights. Can you imagine what that was like? Go read some of the part of Jonah where he is having this conversation and describing some of the things through which he's going. And God finally has you in a place to where it's just you and him. You and him. He's got your attention. And you say, okay, God, I give up. Look at this quote from the book, The Promise of the Second Wind. Those who are at the absolute bottom of their lives, drained of all hope and purpose, are still eligible for a merciful God to intervene. It may not be dramatic, but it can still make the difference between life and death, joy and utter despair. And his deliverance of you may be disguised. Again, it didn't come from where you might think. And maybe today that you're, could be that your eyes are open and you're putting all the pieces together because you think back, okay, and it could have been years ago or recently that, the, that God has stirred you and uh, called you to something and you've walked away from that. And now you're looking at your life in retrospect, maybe this last season, all of these circumstances and you're going, huh, huh. So this is what God is orchestrating because he loves you. And he wants to use you and deliver you. So look at, real quickly, by the way, in verse 10 of chapter 2, we see where the Lord commanded the fish to vomit Jonah on dry land. When he got his attention, he said, okay, all right, here we go. And then in verse 1 of chapter 3, look at what we read. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Is that a picture of grace? God saying, Jonah, I still want to use you. God could have destroyed him, yet he delivered him. <laughs> and he gave him a second chance. And this morning could be a second chance for you. That you know God has called you to something specifically, you've been running, you've been reluctant, but yet God this morning is calling to you a second time because he's gracious and he wants to, to use you. So where is Tarshish for you? Where is that place to which you run to get away from God? And aren't you ready to fully embrace the field, whatever it is, your vocation or a ministry, a holy discontent that God is raising you up to do. It could be Jerusalem. It could be Judea. It could be Samaria. It could be to the uttermost parts of the world. But out of the foyer today are, again, ways you can serve here in this church, in these ministries to exercise your spiritual gift or to maybe look at how God may be stirring you up to serve in another way. So I'm going to ask, if you will, to go out into the foyer. Just take a look. Maybe God, you, 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 maybe you didn't even know what West Conroe was doing in the area like disaster relief or uh, play in, in India or, I mean, all over the world. <laughs> and here's what I'm praying. I mean, and maybe that God is calling some of you to preach that you have rejected that call. In fact, we're going to be praying over a, a young man here at the end of our t time together that was telling me his story that uh, for a long time he rejected God's calling of him. So maybe God's got your attention this morning and you say, okay, putting all the pieces together and Lord, I surrender to you.